Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to CSIS, and, um, and thank you for joining us today, uh, both the people that are here um, present at CSIS and our online audience. My name is Romina Bandura. I'm a senior fellow at the Project on Prosperity and Development. Today we have uh, you know, a, an excellent panel where we're going to be discuss discussing uh, mental health um, in Ukraine and uh, a systems approach to mental health. Uh, this is a very timely uh, topic. As you know, May in the United States is Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, it's been celebrated, well, not celebrated, but observed, let's say, um, since 1949. I, I didn't know that, um, so I looked it up. And uh, the theme for, they have themes for each year. This uh, year's theme is Back to Basics. So uh, I know here in the United States, post-COVID, we, you know, and be, even before COVID, we've had, you know, a lot of, we have a lot of mental health um, issues, and so um, this is not only, you know, uh, an issue that affects Ukraine, um, it affects, you know, the world, and uh, we need to really destigmatize um, uh, mental health challenges. So before I um, start with the discussion and the event today, I'd like to thank um, URC for uh, the partnership uh, that that we have uh, built uh, on this topic. Uh, let me, you know, go back a little bit uh, to last year at CSIS. We set up a commission, uh, a Ukraine Reconstruction Commission, to look to analyze uh, both the challenges and opportunities for Ukraine's reconstruction, and I would say. Uh, the better word is modernization and transformation. Um, so we believe that Ukraine um, will be victorious and can, you know, take this opportunity to really transform its economy um, and modernize um, into the future. So we uh, set up a series of working groups uh, looking both at different economic sectors and different themes. So, you know, health is one of those um, themes, and again, uh, we're very grateful for, for URC. Now, mental health, uh, for you uh, in, in, you know, participating in, in, in this event, um, and for, for you that are looking online, you know, First Lady Olena Zelenska has championed this issue. Um, in Ukraine, uh, she has set up a national mental health and psychosocial support program to help, uh, you know, Ukrainians deal with war-related stress and the effects of, um, you know, traumatic events. And also, what I mentioned at the beginning, to destigmatize uh, the issue. And you know, mental health uh, challenges have effects on the economy in terms of productivity, workforce, um, and others. And so uh, we're going to be discussing uh, a little bit, you know, what are the infrastructure elements of, you know, health systems, uh, what can Ukraine do in the future, and how can partners, uh, including, you know, WHO, the World Health Organization is very active in Ukraine, and USAID, um, as well, how can you know we help Ukraine also modernize the the health sector? So we have um, an excellent panel today. But before the the panel, we're going to hear from um, the um, Ukrainian ambassador to the United States, uh, Ambassador um, Oksana Mar Markarova. So um, I believe I'm, I'm sorry she's not. Uh, able to come in person today, but uh, she was gracious enough to uh, send us some uh, recorded remarks. So please, uh, we're going to hear from her immediately. Thank you. Good morning, dear CSIS colleagues and all participants of today's event. 
Let me thank all distinguished speakers for their focus on the issue that is of utmost importance for the long-term viability of Ukrainian society and state. According to the recent UN survey, Ukrainian people believe that most significant impact of the war was on their mental health. Direct exposure to conflict, loss of family members, encounter with rape, torture, horrible atrocities, loss of property, and stressful conditions inflicted upon us by Russia's unprovoked, unjustified war resulted in a profound mental health burden that can have long-term impact on our society. The Ukrainian Ministry of Health predicts that 15 million would need psychological support. At the same time, stigma remains the main barrier to seeking the psychological support. Ukrainians were not in the habit of consulting with specialists even before the war. One third of our citizens even now do not consider that their problems are sufficient to seek professional treatment. And of course, being regarded by very brave and resilient, and we are brave and resilient in defending our country, but it does make even harder to ask for help individually. Therefore, mental health has become one of the main priorities for Ukrainian government. And as you know, our First Lady Olena Zelenska initiated the National Mental Health and Psychological Support Program. This program aims to help Ukrainians to overcome war-related stress and the consequences of experiencing these horrible traumatic experiences. The development and implementation of the program is coordinated by the Ministry of Health and already includes many Ukrainian and foreign professionals. To attract international support and expertise, the First Lady already held series of meetings and phone conversations with the First Ladies of other countries. As you also remember, during her visit to Washington, D.C. in July last year, she raised the problem of mental health in meeting with First Lady Jill Biden and USAID Administrator Samantha Power. Olena Zelenska requested U.S. government's assistance and support in inviting American specialists to overcome the consequences, but also to train our professionals. Restoring the mental health of Ukrainians became one of the key topics of the second summit of First Ladies and Gentlemen, which took place in the summer of 2022 in Kiev. The problem will also be focus of the upcoming third summit, to take place in September this year. The government of Ukraine also established the Interagency Coordinating Council for the protection of mental health and provision of psychological assistance to victims of armed aggression of the Russian Federation. This agency has assessed the needs, analyzed international experience, calculated our own resources, specialists, services, processes, infrastructure, and offered already proposal of effective solutions to balance the demand from the population with the capacities of the Ukrainian state. In the framework of the National Program of Mental Health and Psychological Support, about 60,000 specialists have completed various forms of training already. We are thankful to support of our international partners who helped in training Ukrainian officials, representing the Ministry of Internal Affairs, employees of the education and social work sectors, as well as employees of Ukrzaliznitsa, the railroad company, Ukrposhta, and the state-owned Oshad Bank. Pilot projects are also being launched within the program. One of them was the psychological rehabilitation of children at various health and educational camps. Through implementation of public communication campaigns, the First Lady encourages Ukrainians to take care of mental health. Just last month, the First Lady launched a very nice How Are You campaign that promotes Ukrainians to take early signs of psychological distress seriously. The purpose of the campaign is to promote the formation of the culture of caring for mental health in society, to provide understanding, to provide help to each other, to show tools that will help Ukrainians take care of the psychological issues. In addition to supporting all initiatives of the First Lady, Ukraine House in D.C., together with the Embassy, have launched the Art Therapy Program with special aim to provide psychological support to Ukrainian children through different forms of art. Dear friends, just like the ability to adapt, function, and even develop during the war, 
Ukraine's prospects for post-war recovery largely depend on the level of emotional solidarity of citizens and the culture of mental health care. It also depends on solidarity of all our friends and allies as we continue liberating our territories, as we continue fighting on the front lines, and as we will rebuild our state. We thank you for your support, and we look forward to your policy recommendations pertaining to the systematic approach to mental health interventions. Thank you very much, and look forward to the discussion. Well, um, thank you, Ambassador. And uh, now I'm going to introduce uh, our distinguished panelists. Uh, so we have uh, two panelists that are here in, in person, and we have uh, two panelists that are uh, dialing uh, from elsewhere. So um, I'm going to, yes. So. The first panelist uh, is Dr. Regina Hishanova Alampe. She is based in Philippines. Um, uh, Dr. Hashanova is a full prof full time professor and licensed psychologist and the chief of party of the USAID Renew Health Project. Um, Dr. Regina was formerly the chair of the Department of Psychology of Ateneo de Manila University and past president of the Psychological Association of the Philippines. So I'm, we, we know, and I'm not going to read all the, the bio because we, um, you know, we're going to take all day. <laughs> but um, thank you for, for joining us. I know it's very late um, there, so we're very grateful that you, you're able to, to join us. Our second online panelist is Dr. Paul Bolton. Um, he is Mental Health and Psychosocial Support Coordinator at USAID. Uh, this is a new position um, in, at USAID. It was created in October 2020. Um, Dr. Bolt, and sorry, and uh, it allows to U USAID to advance the size and the quality of its global work on mental health. Um, Dr. Bolton has over 20 years of experience in this field. Uh, he's uh, worked in uh, prior uh, conflict uh, situations in Cambodia, Bosnia, and others. So uh, Dr. Bolton, thank you for uh, participating. Um, then to my left uh, is uh, Mr. Earl Gast. He's president of URC. Um, Mr. Gass has 30 years of experience in government and private industry. Before URC, he was executive vice president for programs at Creative Associates. Um, and also, you know, he spent uh, uh, decades, two decades at USAID and uh, lived in Ukraine for seven years, right? So welcome, Earl. And then, um, Finally, um, Dr. Am Am Amanda Wynn. She is uh, assistant professor uh, of education and a Garant Global Health Equity professor at the University of Virginia School of Education and Human Development. Um, her research focuses on understanding and addressing global, global mental health disparities um, and she has worked uh, in many uh, different countries, uh, including um, Myanmar, Iraq, Cambodia, Vietnam, Bangladesh, and um, now providing a research into veteran services in Ukraine. So welcome and thank you for, um, you know, traveling from <laughs> UEA. <laughs> and Earl from traveling from uh, Friendship Heights. So uh, <laughs> thank you. And so I'm going to um, kindly turn to our online uh, speakers to give them a chance to a little bit to set the scene of uh, what is happening in, in Ukraine and a little bit of what you are doing. So. Um, is Dr. Uh, Regina online? Okay. Yes, I am. Thank you. Wonderful. And 
And I'd just like to say thank you for this opportunity to share um, our story as well as um, just send our thoughts to the people of Ukraine and all those who are experiencing mental distress. In our case, our story is a different kind of war. Uh, people know about the war on drugs that our president, our former president, um, implemented in our country. Um, it affected more than a million Filipinos and their families. And when we began this USAID project, what we tried to do is take a public mental health response, not just to substance use, but to mental health, because we know that substance use and mental health are quite related. So the first thing that we did was really try to understand our clients. And our assessments revealed that we really needed to integrate not just mental health, but substance use as well. And we under we needed to understand what elements of our population we needed or who in our population we needed to prioritize and who were the most vulnerable. What we found was about 15% were high risk, but fortunately, about half were low risk and did not need clinical intervention. 36% or a third needed some kind of intervention, but not necessarily clinical in nature. And so for the past years, what we've been trying to do is try to take a systemic response. So we began with sites, with, with leaders that we felt did support mental health and substance use. But of course, we did find that we needed to train them and orient them and improve their understanding. A big part of the work that we, we did and we do is on policy development and trying to shape what is a criminalized approach, for example, to people who use drugs and try to shape it towards a more health response. Our biggest challenge, and I assume that is the challenge in Ukraine as well, is service delivery. How do you address millions of clients who need help and what kind of services um, is most appropriate to them? One of the things that we really needed to do was to increase service delivery points because in our country, for example, the ratio of psychiatrists to Filipinos is one is to 200,000. So there was just not enough. And just like the Ukrainians, Filipinos don't like to seek help. There's this sense of shame. I don't want um, others to know that I am suffering. A lot of what we did was social behavior change communication to help destigmatize mental health and to encourage people to seek help. An important gap that we saw was the lack of health technologies, specifically evidence-based technologies that were appropriate for the risk level of our clients. And what what we saw was either they were being given very intensive, very clinical interventions that were far beyond what they needed, or they were being delivered Western, Western interventions that were not appropriate. So, for example, something like cognitive behavioral therapy was being used for people who were not literate. And so they were struggling with the materials. So we tried to really culturally adapt, make sure that our interventions were appropriate. And part of those interventions was going digital. How do you develop self-help? So we developed a mobile app. We developed um, websites. And we made sure that the materials would be something that people could read and they could relate to. Because we didn't have a lot and we don't have a, a big mental health workforce, we had to do a lot of capacity building. Similar to the Ukraine experience, um, Except that because there's not enough professionals, we had to rely on what we call allied health professionals and paraprofessionals. So 90% of Filipinos are Christian and the churches are very active. So we did tap faith-based workers, community volunteers to be able to, live, to deliver mental health and psychosocial support. Of course, the issue is budget. Um, and we had to work with our government partners to find funding for for this kind of services. We tried to do a cost-benefit analysis just to show them that it is worth um, the expense of uh, investing in mental health. Today, we are trying to embed 
mental health as part of primary care and as part of universal health care. And the biggest challenge perhaps is data, um, trying to understand what metrics we need to cover, what kind of m e tools, and just capacitating uh, people because we don't want to just give interventions to people without really proper screening and proper evaluation as well. So this is our story. If you ask me today, are we there yet? I'm going to tell you no or not, but we are certainly further along than we were four years ago. And so I hope our story um, is something that we can take something from, but I'm also very interested to see, to learn from the Ukrainian experience as well. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Regina. Sorry, I'm calling you Dr. Regina. Um, <laughs> we call her Doc Gina. Oh, Doc Gina. Okay, wonderful. And I'm going to call you Doc Amanda then. Uh, so <laughs> Doc, Doc Paul and, and Doc Regina, thank you for showcasing, um, you know, your work. Um, in the Philippines and, you know, some lessons for um, Ukraine, definitely, you know, the scale, uh, the money issue, uh, the data and metrics are, are all important, um, uh, you know, challenges. So uh, I'm going to turn now to uh, Dr. Paul. Um, Paul, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, Paul. wonderful. Great, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invitation to join the discussion today. I'm really happy to be part of this distinguished panel and talking about this topic. I've had the privilege of working in Ukraine since 2015 after the Russian invasion of Crimea. And this was before I joined USAID, but it was part of a USAID supported program to develop community-based mental health services. So I'm particularly pleased to join this group and talk a little bit about um, this and about system issues in general. Um, as, was, as I was introduced, uh, my title is the Mental Health and Psychosocial Support Coordinator. And that refers to both mental health care and psychosocial support. And within USAID, we see these as different but complementary activities. Mm -hmm. Psychosocial report, support refers to broadly applicable activities that are not treatment, but help people mm -hmm. cope with stress in their situation. So this includes making changes in the environment to induce stress, to reduce stress, to improve coping, providing basic information to people to help people cope and stress reduction skills. And so that's how we define psychosocial support within the agency. It's, we consider it to be vital for populations like those of Ukraine, where stress is so common, and where these interventions can really reach large numbers of people. And they can also help to prevent mental health conditions. Mm -hmm. However, the way we think and the way I've described it, th these interventions don't provide treatment for people who've already mm -hmm. developed moderate or severe mental health conditions, right. like depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, substance abuse. And we are seeing a lot of these conditions in Ukraine due to the brutal nature of the invasion. These conditions require treatment by trained providers um, given to individuals and small groups. And this is what we mean by mental health care. Treatment can consist of medications or talking therapies um, like cognitive behavioral therapy, which as was mentioned, need to be adapted locally to wherever you are. Both have been found to be effective in all global regions um, when adequately adapted. But I tend to prefer the talking therapies over medication because they can be delivered in person and by, or by digital means and without medication supply issues. And uh, they also involve the transfer of skills that people can continue to use after the treatment ends. Any system of care should at should minimum, therefore, consist of both psychosocial support and mental health care. Experience in many countries, including our experience in Ukraine, shows that psychosocial support can be done by existing non-mental health workers as part of their other duties, including those working in healthcare and education and social services. This is because, because providing these services does not require extensive additional training, and the activities can be done part-time and still reach many people. 
However, when these workers encounter people with mental health conditions, as we are seeing in large numbers in Ukraine, psychosocial support is not enough. These psychosocial workers need to refer these people for treatment. Over the last 20 years, we have demonstrated in many countries, including Ukraine, that most common mental health conditions can be treated effectively by non-professional providers if given adequate training and supervision. This means that we can train people in small cities and rural areas where currently there are not mental health professionals. We estimate that about 80% of persons with mental health conditions can be treated by this type of provider. For the other 20%, including psychoses and complicated cases, these workers need to consult with and refer to mental health professionals, uh, of whom Ukraine has a, a, a much bigger supply than most other countries. Under this system, the role of these folks uh, is to deal with these more challenging problems. So in this way, the mental health service system, um, as I've outlined it, it really has three basic elements, the psychosocial support, the community-based primary mental health care, and the secondary specialised mental health care. Of course, there are other elements that can be included, but these are the ones that I'm describing as the basic service elements. I'm going to stop here now because I don't want to eat into the time of my colleagues and into the time for the discussion, which I'm very much looking forward to. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Bolton. Um, I'm now going to turn to uh, Amanda for some initial remarks. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I am also very honored to be here today to join this panel. Uh, as was mentioned, I did begin working with colleagues in Ukraine a few years ago. At the time that I was working with them, uh, we were working to scale up a, a mental health treatment program that had previously been tested in the country. Uh, as part of the scale up of that program, we continued to develop out what Paul just described, those psychosocial supports. So we launched an additional program that was kind of a light touch, small group psychosocial support that was really intended both for that preventive effect, um, taking down symptoms where we could, as well as that entry point and pathway to care. Uh, and as you mentioned, that was for veterans. That work was with adults, um, but a lot of my work in my broader portfolio is as in a school of education with young people. And so what I wanted to do today is bring together my experience from different places to really uh, talk about lessons we might learn for a child-focused mental health service system in Ukraine. We know that kids in Ukraine have just been horrifically impacted by the war. Even when there is not a war, we know that worldwide, a majority of all of the mental health problems over a life course emerge well before adulthood, and yet most young people don't have access to quality evidence-based care. Untreated mental health problems in families, parents, communities continue to have long-term intergenerational impacts on the well-being of young people. And I've heard this again and again as a refrain in work I've done around the world, oftentimes when that comes much later during a reconstruction period and we hear um, we all have these patterns because of the war, because of the military activities, and these patterns are showing up in our kids. Or a generation of kids grew up abroad and have lost their traditions and their language. Or kids today have never really known real peace. And with that come these worries about out-migration and um, cycles of violence and problems in the family and all things that have really big repercussions for economic reconstruction. Um, so when we think about the context that kids can interact in, the parents, the families, the schools, the communities, we can ask ourselves, what do we need to put in place so that 10 years from now, we hear about kids in Ukraine, that they're doing okay. And if we work back from that, we get to a pretty close approximation of what's a very comprehensive system of mental health care. So uh, both speakers before have talked about kind of integrating mental health and psychosocial supports into these different sectors. And I wanted to take a bit of a deeper dive into what that looks like in something like education. Um, one of the big psychosocial programs that we often see for young people is called Child Friendly Spaces or Safe Spaces, and it's a great foundational psychosocial program. It's not a treatment program, and it doesn't meet treatment needs. On the other hand, uh, just 
adding in you know, more school counselors, for example, without a broader infrastructure of supports is not going to be an efficient system either because they will be so overwhelmed by the need that they'll constantly be responding to crisis and not able to get past that crisis mode. So when we start to think about these layers that we tier, these tiered layers of supports, we start to see how that can really transform a system like education. And then we start to think about these kids that have been out of school first by COVID and then by the war, and we think they're re-engaged in schools that regularly include concepts about mental health and communications with students. Or um, they include explicit classroom instruction in things like coping skills, stress management, emotion regulation, social problem solving. They work at a school-wide level to rebuild ties and connections and feelings of belonging. We think about teachers that have been trained and feel equipped to identify expressions of distress in their students and to respond to those compassionately in the classroom. And furthermore, to know when and how to get those students connected to counselors for small group or individual supports when they might need support for a range of additional problems. Of course, for teachers to do that, they need to be in a good headspace themselves, right? And so then we start thinking about, you know, it, it goes on. Then we start thinking about how do we provide these supports for teachers? And again, environmentally, in making workplaces better and more supportive, and how can we get um, additional supports to them that are accessible for them when they're in these classrooms all day long, right? Schools could also take a family-centered approach where they start to think, what am I seeing in my students that might also be a symptom of, of unaddressed support needs in their families? And how are we centered in the center of these communities able to respond to those family needs as well? Um, all of those things that I've described really map onto the first two tiers of what Paul talked about is kind of that foundational psychosocial support and those targeted individual supports. And then there are a few uh, other, you know, referral needs, referral out to those uh, services that he talked about. But for the most part, much of that can be done with existing personnel and existing school resources with additional training and support. Mm -hmm. It all feels very um, ambitious and pie in the sky, but we have models that we can base this on, and we know we have data that shows that this really improves student outcomes. So uh, I'll stop there as well, but uh, happy to talk more about that today. Thank you, um, Amanda, and um, it's good to know that you know you can work with uh, you know the existing some of the existing resources um, and then you know train and, and scale up. Um, so uh, finally, I'm going to turn to Earl for your initial remarks on the topic. Great, thank you. Good morning, everyone. So I'm the only non-expert on this panel, so, so I have to be careful about what I say. <laughs> but as Paul said, non-experts, non-practitioners have a role to play. And just recently, I was in the Philippines um, visiting Doc Gina and, and her mighty team and seeing the great work that they're doing throughout the country um, on community-based approaches for mental health uh, to include drug abuse and, and alcohol abuse. And I have to say, it has been a sea change, uh, both in the way that the government views it, uh, views substance abuse, abuse and, the, and the policies that it's on undertaking, um, as well as the impact on people uh, who are being treated through this. In fact, it was just a couple of weeks ago in this very room, President Marcos was here and giving his speech, and he lauded uh, the efforts of his government um, with USAID support in having it treated as a public health issue, substance abuse, mental health, instead of a criminal justice uh, mm -hmm. issue. So I, as Doc Gina said, much work needs to be done, but really uh, phenomenal work in only a few years. Um, in, U in Ukraine's situation, prior to the invasion a couple of years ago, uh, there was a concerted effort to reform the health system. And I would say that that has largely paused. We heard from Ambassador Markarva last evening, and, and she did in fact say that they're trying to reignite um, the, the reform of the health sector. But it's also important to include community-based mental health approaches, as Paul said, and as Doc Gina said. Um, it's important to do so. It's been tried in, in Ukraine. It's being continued in Ukraine. But it's also following um, 
protocols in uh, WHO on community-based mechanisms, as well as Ukraine's own national plan on mental health. Um, but the evidence base is rather thin uh, on community-based approaches and war conflicted areas. Um, and so we've been asked by USAID through USAID's global health project, it's called HERD, Health Evaluation and Applied Research Development. Dr. Amanda has worked on, on that, uh, as well as uh, Dr. Paul, to go in and, and develop the evidence base on what is working, uh, what is out there, and best practices that can be brought in using an implementation science approach. So uh, that work will start very, very soon. Um, in fact, I am traveling out to Ukraine and Moldova in a couple of weeks um, to work with our uh, local partners uh, in, in that setting. But there is a lot of money being spent in community-based uh, mental health programs. For example, uh, Google just recently committed $20 million, money coming in not, from, not just from donors, but also from foundations. So this will be a very good evidence base, <clears throat> not just for the U.S. government, not just for the U.N., uh, but also for foundations as they decide what investments to make. Um, also, this work will be su supported and augmented by an implementation science collaborative uh, that URC and uh, the City University of New York co-manage with USAID support. It's a global network. Ateneo is soon to become a member of that implementation science collaborative, but it's a global network of some 30 in institutions that are involved in research to help evaluate the data and also to dem disseminate uh, lessons learned through its learning platform. The last thing I'd like to bring up in the context of Ukraine is just a couple of days ago, um, Minister Fedorov, who heads up the minist Ministry for Digital Transformation, along with uh, Ambassador Samantha Power, uh, talked about the DIA app um, in Ukraine. This is, uh, this is a transformational tool, uh, digital tool. It's e-government on steroids, which covers everything from applying for a driver's license online to reporting Russian soldiers' movements in occupied areas. But it also could serve as a gateway um, to mental health support. And um, as Dr. Gina knows, uh, her project with USAID and Department of Health support have developed an app. Um, I can't recall the Tagalog word, but it means healthy mind. And uh, that has been peer tested and RCTs have been demonstrated. This is something that we would like to work with the Ukrainians um, on and, and see whether or not we can develop an online application that can help um, yeah. with self-guided interventions. Oh, that's great. Um, so Earl, you mentioned you know, some of the challenges and, and Dr. Jean as well, and you know, in the case of Philippines, um, you know, data and evidence. Um, can, you know, can all of you tell me a little bit about like what are some of the problems that Ukraine had, you know, in the in overall and in the health infrastructure, and what are some uh, before the war, you know, problems before the war, and what has, you know, what has been um, the journey since, and what, you know, how do you see, um, you know, mental health integrated um, into general, you know, the, the health inf infrastructure. So maybe I'll start with you, Amanda, um, and, and then go into Paul, yep. Sure, great. Um, well, I think it, it was already touched on. One of the challenges as it relates to mental health is that history of how the psychiatric system in Ukraine was structured and, and what it had historically been used for, um, which uh, you know was very centralized, um, very kind of psychiatric hospital model. We know that in that, um, for the most part, what they get to there are the very severe kind of psychosis type mm -hmm. mental health conditions, which um, is not what we see in terms of common mental health disorders. Um, so part of the need to disentangle that and, and through these media campaigns that, that um, the First Lady is leading is really changing the community perceptions around what mental health services can do and who they're for. Uh, and you know, she mentioned people not feeling that their, their level of problem is really rising to the occasion of needing help. And so changing that perspective. Mm -hmm. um, from a child perspective, 
I believe the statistics were like 8% of all the services pre-war were serving children. So, um, you know, we were missing a lot there. And I, uh, there were quite a few less child psychiatrists than psychiatrists in general, you know, talking in the hundreds versus the thousands. Um, from my perspective, I think a, a big challenge is a, a real lack of prevention focus there in that, and, and particularly when we think about schools and other places and that need for early prevention. Um, I could go on, but I'm going to just stop with that so that everyone feels like they have something to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll turn to our um, online panelists. Um, Dr. Bolton. Sure, um, just adding a few things to what Amanda said. Um, it was a very centralized system, basically. Um, if you had mental health issues, you would go to a psychiatrist. Psychiatrists would very often admit you and do you know, the um, diagnosis, analysis, and treatment start in the hospital. Um, so what this means is that in rural areas and even in some smaller towns, there really were no psychiatric services um, or mental health services in general, since there was no community-based care. Um, so that was an issue before the war. The whole stigma issue also, mm -hmm. um, not only unofficial stigma, but official stigma. There were some prescriptions in what kind of jobs um, um, and, jo on, and prescriptions on your legal rights if you had a diagnosis of a mental health issue. There was some carryover from Soviet times where um, psychiatry was used to oppress dissidents and therefore had a bad reputation. Mm. Um, people just didn't trust uh, mental health professionals. So in a strange way, well, not really that strange because we see this all over the world. People who provide mental health services are also subject to stigma. They're seen as being a bit weird because they want to work in, in this kind of um, thing. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you. Um... Dr. Gina, I know that you talked about, you know, the case of the Philippines. Um, so um, can you just briefly mention, you know, some of the challenges that you went into with the program um, in, in the Philippines? And because, it, you know, some of the lessons can apply to Ukraine. So one of the one of the first sort of hurdle that people need to do in, in terms of mental health, getting mental health support is screening and assessment, right? When we talk about mental health assessment, usually that's very long, lengthy interviews. And one, people don't have time to do that or they get turned off by that. And so a critical issue is um, what are some sort of short and easy tools that are culturally adapted that can be used at primary at the primary care level. And I'm saying this because, for example, in the Philippines, a lot of Filipinos somatize stress. So they, they're not going to say, I'm distressed, or they're not going to say, I have mental health issues. They're going to come and say, my, my tummy aches or my head aches. So there's a lot of that. And it's very important, therefore, to, to embed this kind of screening closest to primary care, because then the doctors might be able to elevate those symptoms that they're seeing physically and link that, for example, to mental health. And I think that's important. Another point that, or another issue that we saw is that we couldn't just really just transplant certain tools because there's a context to where these tools came from. And sometimes they don't apply. And so the cultural adaptation of tools such that they do apply to the context of individuals are important. So just investing a little bit more in ensuring that the the, the tools are appropriate and they're short enough so that people don't get turned off right away. So on the point of, you know, adapting the programs, because I know, you know, USAID uh, and, you know, URC and, and, and um, you know, UVA, you've been working in different countries. What are some, you know, adaptations that you have to uh, make uh, for your programs um, in terms of, uh, you know, when you're in different countries. So maybe, you know, in the case of Ukraine, you might take a model, um, but, you know, it doesn't really uh, apply. So what are some, you know, some of those changes that you have to make? Um, maybe, I don't know if 
Earl, you want to start? Or, sure. Yeah. Um, and if you don't mind, yeah. I'll go back to the former question. Yeah. Uh, so I spent a majority of my career in the former Soviet Union, and I was there a couple of years after it collapsed. And there was a major mental health crisis. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and so if you think about it, that was the first big mental health crisis in the former Soviet Union. I think life expectancy of males dropped to 47 years of age, but no one did anything or very little was done because everyone was focused on the reconstruction effort. Um, and so we referred to that group as the lost generation. And now if you look at it, two successive major events also leading to a major uh, mental health crisis. I think the difference this time is that there is a lot of attention uh, being focused on mental health, whereas in the past, I, I know that, yeah. it was lip service. And so the, the, the key is to make sure that we're continuing to do and scale up uh, methodologies that work and programming that works. Yeah. I mean, um, just uh, also an anecdote, I, I lived in the 90s in Ukraine, and the same thing, you know, um, uh, even in the workplace you could see people uh, you know, with substance abuse, and uh, when I spoke to coworkers, they would say, "Well, you know, it's it's they're lost. There's nothing uh, for us to do." Like, it, I was very shocked that you know it was just like, "Okay, you know, this this person is is lost." Um, so I, I am, you know, I know that, for example, technology I think has been a very good tool. Uh, you mentioned DIA, but uh, you know, in terms of also um, spreading out the message, you know, and communications in general. So, and we have you know new generations that are connected to um, you know not only digital uh, but to other places. So I think that's also a, I don't know if a, a positive, but uh, that can change you know the perceptions of uh, mental health. Um, so. Uh, sorry, I lost track of the conversation, but <laughs> we were, um, you know, talking about, you know, how you um, adapt different models. So maybe, you know, Paul, I know this is a new um, uh, role at USAID, uh, but you've been working, obviously, you know, for, for many um, decades on this issue. So how do you um, adapt these, these different interventions to the, to the different countries? Well, I, I could refer, I'll, I'll refer specifically to Ukraine, um, what we did there. Um, as I mentioned earlier, people don't want to go to hospitals, they don't want to go to psychiatrists. Mm -hmm. So putting as much of these services as we can in the hands of people in the communities. Mm -hmm. um, for example, um, Amanda mentioned working with veterans, um, mm -hmm. veterans particularly don't want to go to mental health services and they don't want to see psychiatrists or clinical psychologists because they feel that they don't understand their experience. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways we worked around that was to actually train the veterans to provide the services. Mm -hmm. So then veterans were talking to other veterans and this made the program much more acceptable. Another thing we did was that even though we're talking about mental health care for mental health conditions, we moved away from making formal diagnoses basically said you have, you know, a set of um, issues that really could benefit from, from this kind of service. And, and we left it at that. And we talked about mental health challenges, the common mental disorders, as really being life challenges. You know, what happens when you have an unusual or really challenging set of circumstances? To sort of frame it in the way of being... Um, understandable right you know that you you can be a person who if you have had severe events happen as in the war then you can expect this kind of thing might happen to you mm -hmm. and that this would help you um with uh, you know to improve the situation it's also kind of another reason why um, i mentioned in my introductory comments we we try we, we don't go to medications first because that sort of gives the impression that, yes, I have, you know, a diagnosable disease and I have to take these medications, whereas talking therapies seem more or less threatening, less diagnostic, um, in which people learn skills about how to deal with these kind of issues. Um, have being able to bring services 
over the internet, over social media. Yeah. I mean, mental health is so unusual in that way. You know, you can actually provide full treatments. If you're using talking therapies, you can provide the full treatment um, over the wire. So in Ukraine at the moment, USAID is supporting services where people in one part of the country are treating people in another part of the country, even in those areas which are controlled by the Russians and we could not directly access. Um, so that's really has been and continues to be a game changer that we would use not only in Ukraine, but all over the world. It's, it's starting, in some cases, it's starting to render borders unnecessary or, you know, having to cross a border. So we have some councillors working in Poland, working with people in Ukraine. So that also has been a big change. Uh Following up on, on that, are there, I'm sorry for the basic question, but are there any, uh, you know, specific age groups that are more challenging, um, you know, in war situations than, um, than others? Or, you know, I know everybody needs help, but like, um, you know, in your experience, um, you know, Amanda, you touched upon, you know, kids, but, uh, you know, uh, and you talked about, you know, the Soviet legacy, I mean, um, I have an aunt in, in Kiev that she's, you know, 86 and she's lived through, you know, uh, communism, Nazism and, and on all, on all that stuff. So are there any, you know, um, what are the most challenging age groups? I, I, I you know, I, that, that's my question to you and in your experience. Yeah. Well, to the panelists. I mean, maybe Paul, you can start, and then I'm oh, sorry, it's a little difficult. <laughs> well, yeah. I would say one one challenging group is, as you indicated, the elderly. But the reason why they're challenging is because we have spent so little effort and have so little experience on how to deal with them directly. So I don't see them as necessarily more difficult to um, serve than other groups, but we just have not done it, and so we lack experience. Uh, the other group is the other end of life, which is children, but partly for the same reason um, that we have mainly done adult focused programming and we really haven't spent a, time, a lot of time on child um, mental health. You know, as mentioned in the opening comments, you know, if you're talking about psychosocial services to reduce stress and, and like, you know, um, safe spaces, um, like peer support, those kind of things. Yes, we are doing those things. Yes, they're absolutely critical. But then when you talk about actually children getting more than that, getting specific treatments, then we're really not, don't have a lot of experience. We haven't done much. And, and frankly, in Ukraine at the moment, this is kind of a hole in the services and, and programming that we're providing. And Doc Gina, in your case in the Philippines? For us, I think the most challenging is the adolescent period, because even if you don't have context of war the adolescent period is is a challenging period right they're, they're going through a lot of things and their brains have not fully developed yet um and they're they're pretty hard to reach in terms of there's this resistance to adults especially mental health professionals who are adults and so we've had to be really creative for example We've, we've just pilot tested video based interventions that are delivered either by peers or by teachers where we, we talk about, you know, that it's okay that you're feeling all of these emotions, where are these emotions, et cetera, et cetera. So it's this sort of like mental health lit literacy first. And then if you're feeling this way, where can you go? But it's, it's delivered in technologies or media that they can relate to. So. We, we really had to invest um, in terms of understanding this particular population. Back to you. Um, if I could, I'll add one more piece just about children. And I agree with Paul, absolutely, that we haven't paid as much of attention there in terms of treatment. Uh, one of the challenges I think that comes with children relative to adults is that there are so many um, developmental shifts between you know zero and 20, right? And so when we think about treatments, um, for very young children, their developmental needs are different, their manifestation of problems is different, um, and so we would approach that differently, um, perhaps by providing more care through the parents, right? Um, then we get to, um, you know, 
middle childhood where they're really able to kind of talk more about their feelings, but they're very much still centered in a family context. And so treatment there oftentimes involves a parent and a child and you have dyad sessions. And so if we're taking an intervention that was developed for adults, there may be a need to add pieces on to bring in that family member, right? And then, of course, adolescence, we get into their, their kind of pivot and swing into the peer groups and the different problems and the way their distress manifests. And so I think that part of the challenge is um, being able to um, address all of those different developmental needs. And so it takes more studies to build the evidence base for each of these groups. So, um I know, you know, we've discussed what, you know, USA is doing, WHO. Um, these are, you know, donor-based uh, organizations, but there is a role for the private sector here to play. So I wanted to shift a little bit the conversation on, you know, what can, um, you know, different uh, companies in this ecosystem do uh, to support Ukraine. Uh, we get, uh, and I'm sure you also get a lot of, uh, you know, c companies and, and philanthropies that want, you know, want to help. Um, and they're like, we don't know how. Uh, so um, maybe you can uh, sort of tell the audience, um, you know, how can uh, different, you know, uh, Paul, you talked about, you know, pharmaceutical uh, supply chains and, and others. So I know it's a, it's a big uh, uh, ecosystem, but what are some uh, entry points uh, that, you know, companies can uh, engage in the mental health uh, ecosystem in Ukraine? So I don't know, maybe I'll start with you, Earl, sure, because absolutely. you've had a lot of experience also working yes. in the private sector. And also worked with a number of uh, private sector companies right. in Ukraine supporting health. Maybe not mental health, but health. Uh, let me start off by saying that you're, you're right. I mean, private sector organizations can donate through foundations mm -hmm. or to international donors, including USAID. USAID has a mechanism through which it can work with, private, with the private sector. So that's, that's one way. A, a second thing is that before the war, the recent invasion, I should say, we started to see more and more investment in private healthcare delivery okay. in Ukraine to include mental health. So it could be taking those lessons that we're learning through communi community-based um, health interventions and providing those lessons learned, engaging with the private sector uh, health uh, providers. And then I think a, th a third way would be much like Doc Gina is doing in the Philippines, when we talk about community-based um, interventions, she's not working, not only working with um, communities mm -hmm. um, and with religious-based organizations and NGOs, she's also working with the private sector uh, to help with their workforce um, developing resilience. Great. Um, Dr. Paul? <coughs> Yeah, I, I agree with what I was saying. Um, particularly, they can help to provide resources. They can work with governments to not only set up services, but help to maintain the services. And then for the companies themselves, if they're working within Ukraine, um, they can actually promote mental health services amongst their workers and the workers' families mm -hmm. and reach out in that way. Um, we see within government, for example, which that's been my main focus is government services, but, but we see a lot of burnout, right? People are exhausted. Um, and part of, and this is partly a mental health issue. It's partly a stress and environmental issue. Um, I mean, companies can do a lot for their workers and by extension their family and then through demonstration with other work companies and with governments how to take care of the mental health of their workers and make them more effective and reduce burnout. Dr. Gina, yes. How did you work with companies and other private sector um, actors in, in Philippines? Well, we know that poverty, for example, is a social determinant of mm -hmm. mental health. And a lot of times it's because of unemployment 
or underemployment. <laughs> and so an important part of recovery is actually having jobs. And for, so, for example, we are partnering with a um, foundation called Philippine Bus Business for Education. And we're trying to make sure that our clients, uh, especially those who cannot afford to go into um, college, for example, are trained in other skills and there's so there's a sort of a job matching program and at the end of the day there are employers who are willing to support them so that kind of um, giving them something meaningful something to look forward to empowering them that's just as important and i consider that part of you know wrap around support for mental health amanda um not much to add here, but one thing I was thinking is um, in terms of the, the donations and funding, um, industry partners may be particularly flexible to help fund research. So we've talked a lot about the evidence base being pretty slim. Um, many of the humanitarian organizations that I work with, I mean, they really have a bottom line of accountability for program. Uh, and so we're very scrappy in time, you know, piecing together program funding and trying to get other funding mm -hmm. for research to evaluate programs and, and trying to kind of cobble these things together. So um, my impression is that sometimes there's just a lot more flexibility in, in terms of funding and, and how you can use funding to do research, which I think would really help to address a lot of the gaps that we've talked about. And in partnering with research, not just money, but um, bringing in new innovations and in R&D, um, you know, the team that I worked with in Ukraine they do training now that's completely app-based. And so they're training providers using an app that's you know very innovative and cool. And yeah. um, so much of that work, there's just still so much room at that table, I think, to innovate in mental health and just come up with cool tools and cool techniques. And I think industry could be a really great place to source a lot of those innovations. And even, you, you, know, you mentioned education institutions, but you know, higher education institutions in the United States partnering you know, with, we have, you know, Ukraine has great, um, also higher uh, education yes. um, institutions. So that's also a way that, um, you know, that they could um, uh, partner. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not only looking at the short run, you know, obviously immediate uh, needs are, are, are very high, but um, in the long run, you know, we want Ukraine to have a, a modern um, health system. And I think, um, you know, investments from, um, abroad and, and uh, you know, companies, multinational companies uh, that work, you know, in the health space could also, you know, not only provide um, funding, but, you know, it's, it's a business opportunity and it's also uh, an opportunity for uh, technological know-how to be, um, you know, um, uh, transported to, to Ukraine and, and other things, so innovation. So, um, we look at you know the private sector and its uh, and its whole uh, ecosystem. So uh, I want to now leave the last minutes um, for final remarks of the panelists. And I know we have some uh, very uh, you know uh, thoughtful people in the audience that might want to um, uh, pose some questions to our panelists. So I'll give a minute uh, for. Um, Dr. Gina, Dr. Paul, and Amanda and Earl to uh, sort of reflect on the conversation, and then I'll turn to the uh, audience for Q&A. Dr. Gina? So I just want to add something, um, building on your thought of the long haul. One of the things that we realize is because we don't have a large mental health um, workforce, we really need to begin um, developing students, for example, to know how to do. So, for example, our psychology curriculum is changing because we now want students who just don't know about psychology but can actually go and do psych first aid or do community interventions. Um, we're trying now to embed different courses in in sort of service provider is really prepare a workforce for public mental health for the future because we know that there there will not be enough mental health prof professionals in the near future so i think that's important as well 
Paul? I just would, would note a few things. Um, as we work around the world with, in different countries and we talk with populations and local um, stakeholders, we see a lot of interest in mental health and we see a lot of expression that this is important. It's not that long ago where people would say, well, mental health is kind of, that's, that's what you do after you've done the important stuff, mm. like infectious diseases, et cetera. But now we know that mental health is integral to how you address infectious diseases, how you address poverty, how you address education. Mm. But I feel like the message is still filtering upwards. Mm. Um, and the real reason why I think we're having a conversation about what we really can do in Ukraine um, and that we have resources is because of Madame Zelensky. Um, without her pushing on this and pushing and pushing and saying, you know, this is something we have to address, um, we wouldn't have the resources we have now. We wouldn't have got as far as, as we have. And so it's something that we really need to do um, is to advocate at the highest level for mental health. When I work with um, global mental health people all over the world, th there's a really good consensus on what we need to do. It's just that when we talk to each other, we just realise that we just don't have the resources and most governments are not there yet in terms of allocating resources mm -hmm. to mental health, even though WHO and others have shown that you spend a dollar on mental health, you get something like $4 back. Um, so I see part of the role of like sessions like this and um, other work that we can do that should be important is to advocate for people at the highest levels. Um, so that might be another way in which we can deal with private companies, you know, talk to the big ones, talk, use their links to talk to governments, to other stakeholders. But my point is that I think we really need people at the highest levels to realise that and, and support mm. this as a priority. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda? Yeah, hard to go after Paul when he <laughs> takes all my best ideas. Um, no, I, when I was preparing for this today, I was just looking back, as I mentioned, at all this work that I'd done in the past where I'm hearing about these kind of unaddressed problems so many years later and thinking how incredible it is that right now here we're having these conversations today and it is because so much of the First Lady's influence. Um, we, we do have a lot of consensus. We also still have a lot that we don't know. And I know that she said, we don't have time to wait. We need to find the best models and the best evidence that we have from wherever it comes from and, and roll it out and see what works. Um, and so I think that you know, we all around the world have so much that we can learn from Ukraine in this response. Um, the other just small plug that I would say is, uh, I do think that it is possible to develop, if we center adults, to develop a mental health system that fails kids. I think it's much less possible if we center kids to develop a mental health system that fails adults because adults are so critical to the support system of kids. And so we just really uh, reemphasize the need to really consider kids um, and, and their needs going forward and thinking through what that does in, in terms of changing our response. Thank you for that. And um, Earl? Sure, my reflection. Um, I served in Kosovo right after the war and then I served 20 years ago in Iraq during the war, and then in Afghanistan during the surge. And we all paid lip service at that time to mental health support and psychosocial support, but it was lip service. Mm -hmm. And I think that there has been a fundamental shift in, in how the US government and international organizations see it. The fact that USAID created, or the US government created Paul's position just a couple of years ago, never before, and also the fact that more and more resources are going in from the private sector and USAID. So just the other day, the mission director told me that um, mental health is a new focus area for the mission, right. for programming. Mm -hmm. So it all means that we have to develop the evidence base. It can't be done quickly, but as long as we have that commitment to developing the evidence base and sharing that widely, um, hopefully we'll have better targeted yeah. programming. So um, I like that because we, it's a positive uh, you know, uh, approach to a, such a difficult topic. I really uh, 
thank you know the U.S. government for Paul's position and also uh, you know First Lady um, Zelenska for being a champion uh, of this topic and. As I started, you know, at the beginning, you know, we also in the United States um, are, you know, now talking more about these issues, especially, you know, what happened during COVID and we're seeing the uh, ramifications of, of that, uh, of the pandemic. Uh, I say, I think it's, there's like a second wave, which is the, the mental health wave, right? Uh, so um, I, I want to, um, now we we'll turn to our audience and see if you have any questions. There is a, for our uh, in-person audience, there's a mic over there. So just please raise your hand and say who you are and uh, your affiliation and what the question is. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be uh, fielding some of those questions. Thank you. Um, Dennis Carroll from uh, URC. Uh, this has really been an informative discussion. Thank you. This is, I'm not a mental health professional by any stretch, but it's really uh, important that this discussion goes on. One population or group that you haven't talked about uh, are the military. And a year and a half ago, this was a professional army. You can think of it as a civilian army now. The, six months ago, a year ago, they were bureaucrats, um, auto engineers, whatever they might be. Um, and we know that the long-term consequences of warfare on not just the soldiers, but the families of the soldiers. What is the status of, or what are the approaches that can be taken to deal with the mental health issues of this particular civilian army and their families? Thank you for that, Thank you for that question. Um, I don't know if, Paul, Earl, or you know, whoever wants to answer that question. Um, yeah. Paul? Um, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a great question. And it's something that is um, challenging for us. Mm -hmm. um, several weeks ago, I um, was privileged to meet with the uh, Minister for Veterans um, from Ukraine. And um, she quite rightly pointed out that, you know, um, almost everyone is either a veteran, you know, every man between 18 and 60 mm -hmm. is either a veteran or likely to become a veteran in the future. Um, we have some legal restrictions around services to soldiers, but how do, you, how do you address the fact that every man from 18 to 60 is, is a potential soldier? Um, it's something, I, uh, I, if I sound hesitant, it's because it's something that we're still trying to work out. Um, at present, um, I would say that we're trying to serve as many people as we can with whatever challenges they come to us with um, on the basis of being a Ukrainian person affected by war and having mental health concerns. Um, at the moment, we're not dealing directly with the military um, or military organizations, but we're dealing with, with everyone as an individual. Um, and more than that, I, I really can't say um, at the moment, but it is our emphasis and I am proud of the agency for um, as much as possible dealing with, you know, everyone who walks through the door with whatever issues they have, regardless of who they are. Yeah, D Dr. Gina, did you, did you want to say anything? Yeah, so I I do some work with first responders, especially the male first responders. Mm -hmm. um, and the difficulty about soldiers or, or there's that machismo, right? <laughs> that you, you, you need to be tough and the, the work and the tasks that you need to do, you really need to sort of separate your emotions. And so a lot of it we find is really internalized. Um, and it comes out in different forms, like it, they externalize their emotions, alcohol, or um, they vent on, on their wives or the women in their lives. And so the challenge is 
how to get them to seek help, right, in, in such a culture. One of the things that we found, for example, is that there are approaches that, that are less obvious. For example, they might find acceptable because it's not, they don't like talking about their feelings. Mm. And so we found that, okay, let's not talk about things. Let's just do mindfulness, for example. <laughs> and so if that's less obvious, they can, they can just do their breathing um, and meditation without anybody really knowing what they're doing. So, Again, we go back to the culture and, and trying to understand what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And we've also found that um, training co, co-soldiers or co-policemen or co-first responders is very important because just as people don't like to seek help, especially this population, there's that, there seems to be that sort of shame that I need help because now I'm seen as weak rather than tough. So I agree, that's really a tough population to help. And the issue of trust and, and you know, given uh, the post-Soviet, uh, you know, the Soviet legacy um, in, in Ukraine is also um, an issue, you know, how you build trust uh, in, the, in the system. So I don't know if um, Earl, you I wanted to... Make one comment and you know I don't know if the government has a Department of Veterans or Ministry of Veterans um, but what's really important in Ukraine and what it has done extremely well over the last few decades is building um, civil society organizations and civil society plays a prominent role across many many sectors if you will to include Veterans Affairs in fact we were working with an organization a veterans organization uh, after the 2014, uh, after the 2014 invasion, unfortunately, those veterans who formed those uh, civil society organizations have been remobilized um, to fight this war. But I suspect that civil society will be absolutely key to supporting vets. Thank you for that comment. Yep, that's very important too. That's a development, you know, that um, in the last 30 years has uh, been very uh, strong. Anybody else in the audience or um, that? Did you want to say? Yeah. <laughs> There's no shame of for asking questions, so please uh, go Thank ahead. You. Maybe it's more of a conclusion or a recommendation based on what I heard. I was listening keenly to Dr. Yeah. yeah. Yes, Mike Starcinich. I'm here from Pittsburgh. I've been working on Ukraine issues since 1999 including very intensively in the East since 2014. And I'm headed back next month. Um, I'm not a me mental health person or expert. I'm more in democracy and governance and cities and national transition. Um, okay, so I was, the um, systems map was very interesting from Dr. Genius. I was trying to internalize that and learn. And then I was also thinking, where do you start? How does this get going? What's first? And I think you all answered that question very ably everybody with different perspectives. Then I was trying to map that in a kind of a similar systems thing. And I think it might be worthwhile after this meeting to map those two together. Uh, you know, you've got the systems thinking plus the complexity of how to get it going. I think that would be a great follow-up exercise. I just wanted to encourage you all. And I'm really impressed with what I've seen and heard today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that comment. Uh, one thing that is really um, informative right now, I think it just came out a, a couple of months ago, is the mental health um, task force that the First Lady has um, been leading has launched a, a roadmap, and it's a publicly available document that maps everything that um, was in place before the war, everything that has been done since 2014, mm -hmm. and makes recommendations for you know, immediate action and future uh, growth across all these different sectors. And so anyone who is interested in looking further at that, I think it's a really great document to kind of show what can we do today and how does that turn into a future build, right? So, um, you know, we talk a lot about capacity building and training right now. That's a need today. In the future, how do we build that into university training programs, right? So that professionals, when they're coming out, um, have these basic helping skills. And so that type of thing is, um, really touched on nicely, I think, in that roadmap, um, and would recommend everyone look at it, it's online. Thank you. Just, just adding to that, and 
to the previous question, I think we put these these services, these skills, like these treatment skills in the hands of veterans themselves, if they become part of the healthcare system for for veterans, for soldiers, I think that that will have the best access and also the most acceptability um, within Ukraine itself. Soldiers just don't tend to trust people who they feel just don't understand their experiences yeah. and it's similar for their families. Thanks. Wonderful. Anybody else? Hi, no Vaughn. I'm a graduate student at Duke University. I want to know, so is there any difficulty identifying individuals who don't come forward? So it sounds like a lot of these models is based heavily on if a person is willing or able to talk about the mental health that they're struggling with and those kind of aspects. Is there any usage of, say, human AI companion loops and active learning to identify keywords, say that someone is searching to be able to identify an individual is suffering at this degree in the mental health cycle? Just as an aid to understand um, individuals, say veterans, that are going to be coming out of this post-war period who likely may not come forward with any of the mental health struggles, and if there's any way we can identify those ahead of the curve or even after using some of this new um, open AI technology that's coming out. Thank you. That's a very interesting question. I don't know um, if our experts have any insight. Uh Historically, I think predictive analytics for who is going to have a problem, and we know a lot about risk factors, mm -hmm. uh, being able to move from kind of ecological level risk factors to you're going to have this problem and you're not, we've not been great at. Although these new AIs, I have no <laughs> idea. Um, I think it's, it's, it's really interesting. I would want to be kind of cautious in that of making sure that any efforts to use that kind of technology, especially in a place like Ukraine where there has been um, a lot of stigma and fear in the past and thinking about as we link these systems that we're doing it in a way that um, doesn't cause harm accidentally, right? But um, it's a new frontier kind of. Yeah. Yes, so Nicole? Our, oh, sorry. Dr. Jean, I cut you off. What did you want to? Yes. No, so I was going to say that when we build, for example, our mental health mobile app, um, we, we embedded a sort of a self-assessment tool, but we didn't call it, yeah. we, we chose to call it check out, checking out on your well-being. So it's framing, framing what you're doing as a well-being, just check in on what, how you are as opposed to um, what's your mental health? I, I think that's important. And, and we found that, for example, this app, it's pretty popular among the kids, the young ones. And we have been able to spot, um, uh, example, people using the app who might need referral. And so there's, there is a, um, access to, for example, given your score, you can actually be, there's a suggestion of these are the people that you might want to talk to, or, or these are the available resources. So there is that kind of technology available. It's it just important to frame it so that people are not threatened by it. Thank you for that comment. Um, Nicole? Hi, I'm um, Nicole Andal. I actually work here at CSIS. I did attend school in Donbass in the early 2000s. Um, my question has to do with particularly targeting um, elder, more elderly patients, particularly in the Donbass region, who tend to be more suspicious of technology or harder to reach, um, have, you know, obviously very uh, suspicions, many of them having sur survived under the, the Soviet Union, how psychiatric uh, care was used during the time. So my question has to do, have you um, given any you know, thought to how to target or reach that particular population, and in particular, um, older and elderly women who tend to bear the, the brunt of uh, kind of holding things down while uh, things are, are quite unstable. Yeah. Do you, uh, another question? Uh, well, we'll take the last one. Oh, sorry, I thought oh. that was an answer. Oh, you don't want, okay, you don't want to, okay. I guess I'll, I'll, <laughs> Sorry. I'll just say, I think um, 
Yeah, and, and as we move into the world of kind of increasingly technology enhanced service delivery as well, we need to think really carefully about who we're missing in that. And um, Dr. Gina yeah. talked earlier about data and tracking and figuring out where are people coming into services and where are people not coming into services. Um, also just around identification, how are you know, different generations talking about their problems and are we able to assess that well. Um, it's not an area that I have personally done a lot in, but in the review of the literature, I can say it's an area that the field has also not done a lot in and that we really have very little knowledge about how to support the elderly. If I may, again, I'm not an expert, but what I have witnessed in Ukraine before in trying to get to elderly uh, populations is going through the families. And Ukraine, as you know, has a very strong family fabric. And mm -hmm that often helped reach the elderly populations. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's so um, I think we're already uh, at the 11 hour, so <laughs> I want to thank uh, our panelists, uh, especially Dr. Gina, you um, stayed up so late to be with us today. So. Uh, I really thank you for your um, participation and your, you know, wonderful um, expertise. Uh, also for um, the ambassador uh, who was very gracious in, you know, last minute um, uh, recording. And obviously our um, in-person panelists who made the effort to come here to CSIS. So, uh, and, and yeah, of course, Dr. Paul and uh, all of you. And so please um, let's uh, give a round of applause and the AV team that had to, you know, <laughs> multitask with, you know, online and, and in person. So uh, thank you everybody. And um, yeah, thank you for coming. Thank you.